Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Why don't you clap your hands into the Lord? Glory to God. Hallelujah. While you're standing, I'm going to read the passage of Scripture. If you have your Bibles or a device or you can look on the screen, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. And it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth and God said behold I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for me Don't you look at somebody and say, you are just like Adam. Just like Adam. Amen. You can be seated. Adam was created in innocence. When Adam was created, he knew no sin, he didn't know shame, he didn't know guilt, he didn't know fear. Adam was created in God's image. Adam was created pure. Adam was not bound by sin because there was no sin. Adam possessed godly character. Adam was created with godly character. Adam was created with good morals. And then in ch chapter 2, I think it's verse 25, it says that Adam and Eve, they, they were naked, or, or Adam and the woman, they were naked, or Adam and his wife. They were both naked, and they were not ashamed. There was no shame. There was nothing to be ashamed of. This was life. This was the lifestyle. Anybody here ever been delivered from shame and what you thought about yourself? And you, you see, shame causes you to hide. Shame causes you to hide your, your identity. But God did not create us. He didn't create us in shame. He created Adam in innocence. He created him Purely, and, and, and God, it says that in, in, in Genesis chapter 2, that he formed man from the dust of the ground. He fashioned man from the dust of the ground. What was Adam's complexion? Does anybody know? Anybody know what Adam's complexion was? <laughs> he, was he was clay. What color was it? <laughs> was it red clay? Was he like the white sandy beaches on, on the shore? What was, it? what was he? Does it really matter? But God formed him from the dust of the ground, and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And then God planted this garden and placed man in the garden to have dominion in that garden. He, he put Adam in there to, to, to work. He put Adam in there to preserve it and to keep it. Just a side note, when you get into the church, God didn't just save you so you can warm a seat. God brought you here to work. 
God brought you here as a laborer. He didn't just save you to get you off this earth. He brought you here because he has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for all of us and for me. And in chapter 2, verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. When God placed Adam in the garden, he gave him instructions. He gave him instructions to keep it, to dress it. He told him, you, you need to work here in this garden. You need to preserve it. If you're going to be a part of what God is going to do, and if God is, going to, if God is truly the one that fashions you and makes you into anything, you also must hear his words and obey. God has something for you to do because he had something for Adam to do, and you and I are just like Adam. However, there was a problem with Adam. Look at somebody and say, you got a problem. I'm just going to throw out something here. I'm one of those types. You know, they say, look at your neighbor, Pastor Simpson. He picked on it last week. Look at somebody and say, neighbor. That thing drives me up the wall. Find five people, high five them, and da 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 da. I'm like, really? Do I have to move? Can I just sit here and enjoy what I'm doing right now? Look at the person on your left and tell them God is good. God is good. I wouldn't tell you that. That's just, you know, something that. I'm like, yeah, God is good. But can I just tell him that? And so that, that, that thing drives me up. However, I find that I do it sometimes. I find myself, I start saying, look at somebody and say, like, hold on, I can't stand when people tell me to do that. <laughs> So if you ever look up and pastor says, tell somebody, you just see this kind of slow turn and I just look at you and nod, then you get it. What he said. <laughs> but there was a problem with Adam. Adam was alone. Something was missing in Adam. I know God formed him. God fashioned him from the dust of the ground, but God was not done with Adam. There was a piece missing in Adam. When God made you, there's something missing. When you were born, you weren't born as the complete package. There's something missing. There is, there's a void. There's a gap. God has not completed his work the day that you came out of the womb. And in that moment that God created Adam, God was not done with Adam. He said that I am going to create, uh, to, to, to make him and help me for him. In verse 21, he says, And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam. If you're sitting on the pew and a deep sleep falls upon you, that is not the Lord. The Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And what did he do? He slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken where? She was taken out of man. When God made Adam, he said he, he formed him from the dust of the ground. God shaped him and fashioned Adam after his own image. But when God made the woman, he made her. He created her. 
He did not, he didn't mold the woman like he did Adam because he already fashioned the man. He took the rib out and he created. Those are two different words there. He didn't, he, he didn't mold like clay. He did that with Adam. That was already done. But what he did was he took that rib out and he built a woman. He built something from the man. And he didn't build that woman to stand as something independent of the man. He built that woman to stand alongside the man. He built that woman to balance the man. He built that woman to support the man. He built that woman to strengthen the man. He built her up. So basically, what Adam did not have, he had in the woman. What Adam was missing, he had in the woman. All of you men, all of you married men, say amen. Amen. The house has to be converted as a little child. I hope that's a boy back there. So if you're not married, he's not married. He's saying amen. I guess he must see somewhere down the road. He said amen. I see. He said I can see her walking down the aisle. <laughs> Scripture says, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And and uh, obtain a favor from the Lord. Now, you don't get just a good thing. Uh, yeah, you get that, but you also get God's favor. Amen. 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 But when that woman was created, when God made her, he brought some stability to Adam. He brought some structure to Adam. He brought to Adam something that when, Adam, when you're having a low day, come lean on me. Adam, when you're down, I can help pick you up. Adam, when you don't have strength, I can help be your strength. I can help be your support. Adam, when you can't see, let me help you by being your eyes. Adam, when you can't hear, let me help you by, by, by being your ears. Let me walk alongside you and be what you need. You see, when Adam made the woman, Adam, or I'm sorry, when God made the woman, God wasn't starting over. If God was making a man, he would be making man from the dust. But when God made the woman, he was not starting over from scratch. But he made the woman, he created the woman based on what was inside of the man. He created her and built her based on the qualities that he put inside of the man. He was adding to the elements of the man. So God was sending Adam some help. Adam was sending Adam. Can I say this? Adam was sending, God was sending Adam the answer. What is the answer? You know what your answer is this morning? Your answer is help. Your answer is help. Well, no, I need God to fix and do this. No, no, no. Your answer is help. Psalm 121 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh not my money, not my finances, not my food, not my deliverance, but my help. My help comes from where? My help doesn't come from the federal government. My, my help doesn't come from this world. My help doesn't come from the systems of this world. No, my, my help is going to come from the church. My help is going to come from the pastor. I know if I can just get the pastor's number or get somebody's number, if I can just call on them, I know I'll be all right. You ever went to go call, ever go to call somebody and you, the call just wouldn't go through? Maybe that was a sign. You're dialing the wrong number. Maybe 911 isn't the answer for you, but it's Jesus, uh, the one that we talked about earlier. Jesus is the one that I need to call. 
Psalm 124 and 8 says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. You know, God knows all about your trouble. God knows exactly where you are in that trouble. Furthermore, God might have been the one that sent the trouble your way. God might have been the one that fashioned, tailor-made, and put your name on that trouble. Say, J.B. Barnes, I got something for you. It's called trouble, and it's got your name on it. What are you going to do? I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. I'm going to call on the one who is my answer, the one that my help is going to come from. Yes, we can call on friends and, 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 and all of that, and sometimes we talk to too many people. We've got too many resources. We've got too many names and numbers in our phone book of people that we can call on. Sometimes we need to go and turn to tear all that up and shred it and just take out that one name that is consistent, that one name that is faithful, that one name that is tried and true. Our help is in the Lord. The Lord hear thee, Psalm chapter 20, verse 1. says, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary. Send thee help from the sanctuary. You know, the children of Israel had this thing. Imagine. Imagine you being an adversary of the children of Israel, and you go out to battle against them, and you've got you your 50,000 soldiers, and they come out there with 5,000 soldiers, and in your mind, there is no contest to this thing. We'll, we will win in a matter of just a few minutes. This will be a knockout, no questions asked. But then they've got this thing working for them, this, this God, this Jehovah. And, and, and something happens when they call on his name. The battle that we should have won, we lost because they've got this God on their side. And the children of Israel, God would manifest himself in the sanctuary. God would manifest his presence in the sanctuary the place where he dwelled, where, where, where he would abide, where he would live. And that scripture says, send thee help from the sanctuary. Can I tell you that you don't have to go to a physical establishment to get into the presence of God, to get God's help. You don't have to come to this building to get his help. That was something that happened in the Old Testament. But here in the New Testament, in this day and age, when I call on the name of the Lord, that is just as good as me getting up and walking into where his presence is. <laughs> If God was limited to this building, then we might as well live in here and set up camp. Mark our territory. This is my pew, not just to sit in, but I'm living here. Lord knows where to find me. Let me get my name on the outside. This is my row. He says, send thee help from the sanctuary. Strengthen thee out of Zion. If you want to be a lone wolf, you're not going to get help. Because you're only going to find help in the church. You're only going to find help as a part of the body of Christ. You're not going to find help apart from that. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. The psalmist said in Psalm 73, he got to looking at the prosperity of the wicked. And his feet, he, he, almost, he almost fell. His feet had almost slipped. And he got to looking at their lifestyle and, and, and he started comparing how I'm living based on how they're living. What I'm reaping based on what they're reaping. It seems like I'm doing all this work and I'm doing all this in vain because they are living, they are living horrible lives and they are, it looks like they're blessed. But he didn't stop there. In verse 17, he says, but when I went into the sanctuary of the Lord... 
than I had some understanding. When I got into the presence of the Lord, I had some understanding. You see, that's why we can't limit God's presence. We can't limit God's reach to just this building, but I've got to find a way to get into the presence of God beyond this building. I've got to get my own relationship with God. I've got to get my own connection with God because he is my source of help. And just as uh, just as God sent Adam help, God is the source of your help. God is the source of your help. God knew what Adam needed to complete him, and God knows what you need to be complete. Without God, you are imperfect. With God. Without God, you are incomplete. Without God, you're missing something. Without God, you are flawed. When you look back in the past, you see where you are without or, or where you were without God. I was just stumbling along the way. I didn't know where I was going. I could not walk straight. I had no direction. I had no vision. But God came and he found me. God sent me help. You see, all of us are just like Adam. As babies were born innocent, there is no shame. You say, well, God sent me help, but that help got me in trouble. <laughs> you had a choice to make, Adam. You were commissioned to, to, to guard and preserve that garden. You were commissioned to guard and, 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 and even preserve your wife. Can I tell you, Eve didn't get Adam in trouble. Actually, she wasn't called Eve then. She was called the woman. The woman didn't get Adam in trouble. Adam ate the fruit all by himself, and Adam got Adam in trouble. Well, God, the help that you sent me doesn't seem to be working out. God's help is always perfect. What you choose to do with the help, that's gonna do, that will determine the end result. They were complete together. I don't care. And, 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 and again, notice, when that woman ate the fruit, they didn't realize they were naked. When Adam ate the fruit, Anybody know what kind of fruit it was? It was a mango or something, right? <laughs> when Adam ate the fruit, they were naked. Adam made the choice. And you see, just like, just like Adam, we all make choices that cause us to fall on our face. We all stumble, but just like Adam, we also can be covered with the righteousness of God. Just like Adam, we can also be clothed. But you see what Adam had, Adam had something that God would reveal later on. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus begins to reveal, or he allows to be revealed through a question, who he is and his plan. It says, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they say that some, and some, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto, uh, unto them, but whom say ye that I am? If Jesus asked you the question this morning, who, who would you say that he is? Well, he's, he's somebody I call on in trouble. He's somebody that I've heard about, somebody that I read about. He's the person that paid my bills last month. He's the person that healed me when I'm sick. Or can you just sum it all up like, 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 like Peter, he said, thou art the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the one that we have been looking for. You are the one that has been sent to us. You are the Son of God. You are our, you are our Savior, the one that has been talked about and prophesied about. You are the Son 
of the living God. And then Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, the Lord had a plan to build his church, but it was based on who he is. It's not based on, his church is not based on who I am as an individual. Who his, who his church is and who his body is, it's not based on my knowledge of anything. It's just based on his identity. He is the Christ. He is God all by himself. Uh, Jesus Christ is God fully manifested in the flesh. That's who, that, that's who God is. And he said, upon this rock, upon this understanding, upon this revelation, I'm going to build my church. You know how Eve was created? Eve was created based on how Adam was fashioned. Eve was built up based on who Adam was, not on her own identity. She was, she was built based on the character that Adam had. You know who you can be? You don't have to be built up like the first man, Adam, where you are flawed and, 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 and frail and one day will be a failure and then always be a failure. You don't have to live with that mindset. But the Bible talks about there was a first man, Adam, and then there was a second Adam. Which Adam are you this morning? Are you still the Adam in the book of Genesis who one day knew innocence, who was one day born in innocence, but one day made a choice and fell and, and God had to come and cover him and clothe him. And then from there, he would work with his hands, pulling weeds and all of that. Or can you identify yourself with that second Adam talked about in the Bible? In first Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible begins to talk about this second man, Adam. You see, in that first man, Adam, in his innocence, he only knew so much of God. And then after his fall, he saw God's mercy. He experienced God's mercy. He experienced God's help. He experienced grace in that day and in that time. But that man, Adam was incomplete, and God brought about the woman to complete him. But will you be, as that first man Adam, in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, it says, if in this, li if, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If you're keeping an eye out on your mailbox and on your bank account waiting for the next check to come in, you are most miserable. If you're waiting for, for, for a payday to come through so you can pay the next bill, you are miserable. If you're waiting for that next doctor's appointment to get good news, you are miserable. If your hope is in this life and in this world and hoping that things will turn around and things will change, maybe I'll get the car that I want, maybe I'll get this dream and that and all that, you are are most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Are you going to live after Adam? Are you going to live after the flesh? Are you going to be like Adam? Are you going to be identified like the first man, Adam? He did have some help, but Adam was only made of the dust. Adam can only be identified as the dust. Adam can be no greater than the dust. Are you only as good as your flesh? Are you only identified by your flesh? 
or you only identified by your deeds. It says uh, of, of um, Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, it said that he prayed and he gave alms and, and his prayers went up as a memorial before God. If the only thing that you're going to do is just deeds and actions on this earth, you will be miserable. But there is more that you must do and there's more that God has called you to do. The Bible says that Cornelius was devout. Cornelius, he was not a Jew, but he was devout. And God looked down on that and said, this man needs more than what he's doing. All that he's doing is not going to bring him salvation. I've got to, I've got to bring salvation to him. Skipping down, I know I'm jumping around, but in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The breath of life was breathed into him, and the last, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Are you just going to be a living soul? Somebody that has a life on this, on this earth. I've got a job. I can pay my bills. I've got a house to live in. I've got food to eat. I've got a car to drive. I've got a good family. I've got some friends. I go to church on Sunday. I go to church on Thursday. I go to Bible study. I go to small group. I've got these things. Are you a living soul or has your spirit become quickened? Have you been filled with the spirit of God? Are you alive by the spirit of God? Are you walking by the spirit of God? The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not uh, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The first man thinks like a man. The first woman thinks like a woman. The first man rationalizes things like a man. The first woman does the same thing. They act like human beings. God did not call us just to live as human beings and just to rationalize like human beings. The Bible says that his thoughts are above our thoughts. If you're trying to take on the mind of Christ in your natural state, it can't happen. If you're trying to be like God, apart from God, it will never happen. If you don't spend time with God, spend time in prayer. Spend time fellowshipping with him. Spend time walking with him. Spend time casting cares on God. You will never be like you. You can't even begin to think like God. You can't even have faith in God. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You can't hear from God unless you spend time with him. You can't hear from God unless you fellowship with him. You can't hear, you can't hear from God unless you walk with him. At times, uh, unless you're still with him, uh, unless you meditate on him, none of these things can happen in my natural state. I can't be like God. I might be created in his image. I might have his likeness, but at the end of the day, I'm just going to be earth and flesh. Don't you know that flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God? Flesh is not going to enter into the kingdom of God. I don't care how good you are. Flesh is not going to enter into the kingdom of God. I don't care how devout you are. Flesh is not going to enter into the kingdom of God. I don't care if, I don't care if you're a leader. I don't care if you're a singer in the church. I don't care if you're a Bible study teacher, a small group leader, a pastor, a minister, whatever it is. None of those things will get you into the kingdom of God. Money won't get you into the kingdom of God. You can't be like Simon in, in the book of Acts and buy anything from the kingdom of God. Put your money away. It's not going to do you any good. You can't, you can't earn the kingdom of God. You can't, you can't deserve the kingdom of God. We can't deserve the kingdom of God. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. 
I don't know about you, but I don't want to be just earthy. I want that quickening spirit. I want that spirit that is alive. I want that spirit that is working uh, to be not just working in everybody else. Uh, you see, everybody else all around me can have the spirit. Uh, that's not good enough. It's not good enough for me just to be present in the room. <laughs> I don't want to just know that the presence is here. I don't want the presence to just come walk by me and just wave at me. But I want to connect with the presence. I want to connect with the help. I don't want to just know that you've got help, but I want some help. I want help to walk alongside me. Verse 48 says, as, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as the heavenly, that word just sounds dirty, earthy. Here we go. I'm going to mess with y'all now. Here we go. Look at somebody and tell them you're just earthy. <laughs> you were made from the, we were made from the dust. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But when you have a created being that was in heaven, that displayed. Did that just get there? Oh, okay. I thought he was modeling for the camera. I was like, that's perfect timing. <laughs> Going back to that lesson that, that we had in leadership development, you, you wait till everybody's looking and make it look. I'm sorry, you just, that was just perfect timing. Catch that on camera. Did y'all see that? I picked it up. Did y'all catch that? <laughs> sorry, that just... Perfect timing. Now I lost where I was headed. Good job. I got it. Now I know. I thought I knew. A created being displaying the glory of God, beautiful, with jewels arrayed in heaven. Showing the splendor and majesty of God is kicked out because he decided I'm going to take my throne and, and, and not just put it next to, but exalt it. Gets kicked out. But then he decides that he's going to come down here and mess with God's creation. That is just dust. I'm telling you what, that makes me stand up a little prouder, if I can say it that way. Makes me stand just a little taller and say, you know what, you fell from heavenly places. And God made me lower than the angels. God made me a little lower than you. God made me out of dirt. But you know what he gave me? He gave me his name. He fashioned me in his, he didn't even make you in his likeness. He made me in his likeness. Uh, he made me after his image. And so when I look in the mirror, yes, I see a reflection of dust. Uh, but when I go and read in the word of God, uh, I find out that I'm an overcomer. I'm more than a conqueror through him. Uh, not because of what I've done, uh, but because of what he's done. So guess what, devil? You know who I look like? I look just like that one that you crucified and tried to kill. I look like him. I walk around in his name. I walk around with his authority. I walk around in his power. So you might have thought that you won in the garden when Adam ate that fruit. But guess what? When I fell, when I fell, Guess what? Here's the difference. God came with wrath. God came with judgment upon Adam. But God covered him. You know what? So, you know what, adversary? Yes, you know what? Tomorrow I'm probably going to fall. But when I get back up, I'm going to see you again. I'm going to get back up. I'm not going to stay down. I'm sorry. to The adversary has too many of us thinking like that first Adam. 
That first Adam, when he left that garden, he had to work. I'm trying to find the right word here. He had to work his tail off. Thanks, Adam. Now we got weeds on the islands in front of the church. Thanks. Got weeds growing up out of the sidewalks. We live like that first man, Adam, where we make that choice and we fall. And then we're working and toiling the rest of our lives, trying to just trying to get back to that place that God desires for us. But God has it now that I, I will fall. I will mess up. I will think a wrong thought. I say the wrong thing. I'm going to do the wrong thing. But it doesn't stop there. You see, now inside me, I've got this spirit that's alive. You see, the spirit of God is not just external to me. I don't have to go to, I don't have to get out of my house and go to the sanctuary to find the spirit of God. Now. I've got the Spirit of God right where I am. So that when I, all I have to say is, Jesus, uh, he's present. Uh, he's an ever-present help in trouble. Uh, and guess what? When guilt and condemnation and shame show up, I don't have to live like Adam and go run and hide from the presence of the Lord. Uh, I can go run to my strong tower. I can go run to that sacrificial lamb and say, Jesus, uh, I've messed it up again. Uh, Jesus. I've fallen again. Uh, Lord, have mercy on me. The adversary would say, you're no good. Look at you. You're naked. You're exposed. You're guilty. And you know what? When I'm standing there at the stand, uh, even before the judgment seat, I say, yes, I'm guilty. How do you plead? Uh, yeah, the devil's over here persecuting and prosecuting. I am guilty. Hands down. No questions. Yes, I was did it. Uh, I did it. My fingerprints are on it. My footprints are on it. Uh, I did it. I was there. You got me on camera. You got me with facial recognition. It was me. No disputing it. You can take the DNA test, fingerprint, everything. My social security number is 123456. Yeah, some of y'all were like, oh. It was me. Yeah, I did it. The adversary says, see, he's guilty. He deserves death. He deserves punishment. He doesn't deserve anything more. You see, Adam was blessed. It said that the Lord blessed Adam and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Adam was blessed. Adam had dominion. Adam had authority. But when Adam sinned, Adam lost that dominion and authority. When you sin and when you fall, you don't have to lose what God has given you. Well, I've lost my place in God. No, you haven't, because just as God, just as God created the woman from the man, God built her up from the man based on what was in him, the same way God builds his church. And when God built his church, God built it on who he was. You got to know who your father was uh, or, or who he is. Uh, you've got to be able to identify who your, who your creator is. And based on who he is, uh, I can find my identity. I find my nature based on him. And his nature is pure. His nature is innocent. His nature is just. Oh, I feel it right now. People, you, you got it going through your mind, but I know what I did yesterday. I know where I've been this past week. I know what my world has looked like. Can I tell you, when you think like that, you're thinking like Adam. You're thinking like that first man, Adam. You're thinking like that earthy Adam. Earthy Adam lives in the past, but you've got to change your mind. You've got to train, change your train of thought and begin to think like that second, that last Adam. 
You see, because that last Adam, he died for your sins. He died so you could be washed, not so you can live and think about the past, but so that you can live and move forward. And when you look at the past, you can rejoice, you can dance, you can sing and shout. And even when the adversary shows up and say, look at what you used to be. Paul even said it, and such were some of you. But he didn't stop there. You've been washed. You've been washed. Uh, you've been washed. Uh, some of you, need, if nothing else, walk around and say, I've been washed. The devil wants to come uncover you and say, but look at everything in the past. Look at what you messed up. Take those skins off. You don't deserve that. You don't deserve that robe of righteousness. You don't deserve to walk like this. You don't deserve to live like this. And let's be honest. Be honest with him. Say, no, I don't. You can do like the kids on the playground. Well, you're just mad because my daddy is who my daddy is. You're just mad because my daddy isn't your daddy. He might have created you, but he's not your heavenly father. He might have been your creator, but he doesn't cover you. He hasn't cleansed you. He hasn't washed you. He hasn't made you new. See, the devil can only live in the past. He can't live in the future. The only future that he can live in is knowing his days are numbered. That's it. But he can't live in your future. At best, he can live in your past and try to convince you of who you are based on what you were. But who you are is not based on who you were. Who you are is based on who he is. It's God that justifies you. It's God that makes you innocent. And you can be made in his image on this earth. You don't have to conduct yourself as just some earthly creature that all you know is sin. All you know is corruption. All you know is fear. All you know is failure. All you know is depression. All you know is anger. That's all that mankind knows. All you know is violence. All you know is hatred. All you know is oppression. That's all that the earthy Adam knows. But that last Adam, that quickening spirit, he says, I'm going to make you one of my sons. I'm going to make you a part of my body. I'm going to send you some help. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The Lord said, I'm going to send you some help. I'm going to manifest something that you haven't seen yet. You see, what you used to know walked along with you in the flesh. But the end result is not that you just have a human being walking alongside you. But now I'm going to walk, I'm going to reside in you. You see, the devil could only reflect the glory of God. I've got the glory of God living on the inside of me. Inside of me. So when you see me, now we can graduate. I'm not just earthy anymore. Now I'm heavenly. I'm heavenly. I can be just like Jesus uh, walking around in this temple because this temple, this body is not my end destination. Not, it's not the end of my story. Thank God it's not the end of my story. Thank God this life is not the end of my story. Thank God that what I am today is not the end of the story. But God has called us to be just like Adam. But be careful which Adam you identify yourself by. Will you be the earthy Adam? That you're just dust. 
and you just act like dust and you just conduct yourself like dust? Or can you be like Jesus Christ? Can you be a more than a conqueror? Can you be an ambassador for Jesus Christ? Can you be an overcomer? You see, God will send you help if you call on him and ask him for it. The Bible says that he won't leave you. He won't forsake you. And you know what? His church, God doesn't just build up this defensive mechanism that he's just trying to preserve his church. God, God doesn't live defensively. Do you know that? God doesn't live defensively. Let me just protect and keep mine. You know what God's best defense is? God's best defense. God's best defense is a group of people that move forward, uh, that, that, that progress in him, that take territory in him, not just trying to preserve what they have. There's a song that says, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. You can take all of it. Take all of it. Just give me Jesus. If I have Jesus, I've got all that I need. I'm not lacking anything. I'm not missing anything. You see, when I got the Spirit of God, I got everything that I needed. He became my help meet. He became my comforter. He became my grace. And where, the, where there was darkness in this life, now light is shining through that darkness. Where there was no hope in this life, now there's hope. There is hope. And I have that because of Jesus. Which Adam are you this morning? Which Adam have you been living like? Can you look and identify, you know what? Yesterday I had an earthy mindset. I had a mindset like this world. I had a mindset of bondage. You see, the earthy Adam says, once I have been something, I will always be something. And earthy Adam says that in the past I was bound and I will always be bound. And earthy Adam never loses the, and never parts ways with the identity of the past. That earthy Adam says, once in sin, I will always be a, a sinner. Once unrighteous, I will always be unrighteous. Once a failure, I will always be a failure. Once depressed, I will always be depressed. Once a drunk, I will always be a drunk. Once an addict, I will always be an addict. Once fearful, I will always be fearful. But that second Adam, that last Adam, it says, what I once was changes today. What I once was, the mindset of how I used to live changes today. The Bible says that we are buried with him in the waters of baptism. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In that old nature, everything just remains old. But in the nature of Christ, all things are new. Who I was is not who I am today. Who I am today is not something that I made, but it's based on Jesus Christ. You see, in this earth, I can take on his nature, take on his image. I can live according to his character. His fruit can be produced in my life, in this earth, in this life. You see, I don't have to wait to get to heaven. And I know when we get to heaven, we will be changed. 
in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, this, this corruptible is going to put on incorruption. But while I'm here on this earth, I can be changed into his image. I can be changed into his likeness. I don't have to live like everybody else. And you see, that's why we walk around with this hope that we have. You see, in this vessel, in this earthen vessel is a great treasure. In your earthen vessel, in that vessel of earth, there is a great treasure. We have the good news on the inside of us. And this world is looking for that good news. You see, the outside may not be the most glamorous, but the in, on the inside, there are heavenly things that are at work. On the inside, it's a spirit that's alive and that's well, that's working. You see, death is not alive in this body. Or, I'm sorry, death is alive. But in this spirit, there isn't death that's working. But there's life. Life that's working to eternal life. Would you stand? Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power of God may, of the power may be of God and not of us. Then he goes on to say, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. Where? In our For we which live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus Christ might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. You see, where you are right now, though imperfect, though messed up, flawed, frail, persecuted, distressed, troubled on every side. God is desiring to manifest his presence in you, in that vessel of earth, in that vessel of dirt. God is desiring to abide there. That's why for those that say, I got to clean, get, get myself cleaned up and get my act together for God to come live in me. Can I tell you that is nothing but a lie from the pits of hell. You don't have to and you can't get yourself cleaned up. But God is looking at that vessel. God knows what's in there. God says, I want you. I want that vessel. But God, you don't know what's inside. God knows what's there. But God is not clean. It's like our houses. If somebody were to just pop up without us knowing and things were in disarray and out of order, we'd be scurrying around trying to get things cleaned up and make it look nice. Can I tell you, you can't put things in good enough order. You can't wipe things down good enough. You can't disinfect good enough. I don't care if you got Clorox or if it's, a, if it's knockoff. I don't care if you've got bleach. I don't care if it's Lysol, Pine Sol, or any other Sol. You can't get it done good enough. 
You can't fog the house good enough. I don't care how many surfaces you wipe off. You can't get it cleaned up. You can vacuum, shampoo. You can call Stanley Steam or anybody else to come over and deep clean. You cannot get your house in good enough order for it to, for it to be presentable to God. Because if you were to do that, then you can take the credit for how you look, how you walk, how you act for cleaning yourself up. But he died on the cross so that he can get the glory in your life. Oh, will somebody just reach out to the Lord here and say, Lord, uh, Lord, cleanse me. Lord, wash me. Lord, I don't want my cleansing to be anything of my own doing. I don't want my cleansing to be man-made. I don't want my cleansing to be something that I've done. I don't want my cleansing to be something that, that will bring me glory. Lord, you cleanse me. Like the psalmist said, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Lord, you do it within me. God, I don't have what it takes to be clean. I don't have what it takes to cleanse myself. God, I can't get this earthen vessel cleaned up. Only you can. God, you're the one that justifies. You're the one that purges. You're the one that purifies. Cleanse me, Lord. Cleanse me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I can't do it good enough. God, I can't do it right enough. Lord, anything that I do on my own, it's in vain. Cleanse me, God. Oh, can we go a step further? Lord, I don't want to be, I don't want to be like the earthy Adam. I don't want to think like the earthy Adam. God, I don't want a mindset like the first Adam. I don't want to live like the first Adam. But, Lord, I want my mind to be transformed. I want my thinking to be changed. I want my heart to be changed. God, I change my mind by your grace and by your help. I change my mind and my, my way of living, my, my way of thinking. Some of you, you look at yourself and say, I, I'm not deserving. I'm not worthy. I know what's in this vessel. I don't want God coming into a contaminated vessel. Can I tell you, God is the only one that can cleanse your vessel. God is the only one that can cleanse your heart. You might as well open up the door. Why don't somebody begin to do that right now? Why don't somebody begin to open up the door and, and let God come in and begin to cleanse? Let God be the one to help you change your mind, help you change your direction, change your course. Shati harana rieki arono, morana rara kie arono roro koye. Oh, come on, right where you are. Why don't somebody reach out for the Lord right now? Iki harana rara kie. If you feel to come down to the altar, it's open. You can do that. If you're comfortable where you are, that's fine. But why don't you open up your heart and your spirit to the Lord? Church, why don't you be sensitive here? He harana kaye ya shati ya harana. Mo korona ro ro korie ya harana ro ro kaye. Lord, I want to be, I want to be like that last Adam. I want to be like that last Adam. I need my spirit to be quick, and I want Your spirit alive in me. I don't want death just working in my members. Lord, I want you working in my members. I want to be built up on the foundation of who you are. I want to be built on your character. I want to be built on your innocence. I want to be built on your holiness. I want to be built on your righteousness. Oh God, search me. 
church to me. Lord, you know when I go out and you know when I come in. You know when I lie down and you know when I get up. You know what I need, Lord, before I ask. Lord, I need your mercy. I need your grace. I need your blood. I need your covering. God, I don't want to just have it here in this place.
this building uh, for service tonight. We'll be down at Antioch Central at 6 o'clock. Look forward to fellowshipping with all of you and seeing you there. One, actually, one thing I forgot to mention, um, it is a fellowship. The, the attire is uh, business or nice casual uh, so it's not a, a formal affair but it is casual um, so amen god bless you one more did I, I think i saw her she's being ministered to i have a baptismal certificate to present to mackenzie gibson 